sit with me for a moment by the water. The Jordan River is not particularly large in places, really no more than a glorified creek, but every body of water has a story to tell. Perhaps you know some of them. But if you can't quite picture the Jordan, insert a different body of water, something that's meaningful to you, maybe a lake that you love, or a canal, or an ocean. Just have a seat next to it. Watch how the water moves. Feel it. Look at the bubbles, the lapping of the waves. Get a sense of the smell while you're sitting there next to it. Feel the moment. Got it? Now let's imagine that sitting next to us as we watch the water is Jesus himself. Whether we're sitting at his right hand or his left is up to us, but let's assume the place was prepared for us. As we sit next to him, we are surprised just a little bit, dark-skinned, Middle Eastern. He looks young, 30 years old, too young to be a leader of many people, and yet he's going to be. Not quite yet, of course. This is before he's done anything significant in his life. As he sits next to us just after his baptism, we don't see the baptism itself. He's sitting there next to us, and we can see his mind beginning to turn. This is before he's preached a single sermon, before he's done anything of note, before he's yet, before he's raised even a ruckus. He's just sitting by the water, praying, sitting by the water, connecting with God. Water does that to us, doesn't it? It's sort of strange. We don't quite know what it's about. We can't quite put our finger on it because it's water, but we can't quite put our finger on it. There's something different about water, something that is unique to the water that just makes us a little more us. Not everyone, of course, but some of us, the moment we get near the water, we can feel those anxieties, those burdens, those stresses start to float away. Theologically, of course, we know that God is wherever we are, that God is present in all creation, but there's something unique about water, something about water that is one of those thin places between the eternal and the temporal that makes us recognize God is there. It's hard to stand before a large body of water and not appreciate the vastness of creation. Maybe we know our need for it. Maybe somewhere deep, we know that we need water to survive. And make no mistake, friends, we need water to survive, though I once did a funeral for a woman who swore that she never had a drink of water in her life. Her funeral. <clears throat> but even if we don't drink it, friends, we know that we need it, don't we? to wash, to clean, to bathe. We use it to grow our food. We use it to clean that which is around us. In the winter, we shovel it from our driveways. In the summer, we splash in it. Too much, of course, can do damage, just as too little can cause harm. It carved out the earth around us, and it literally holds the earth together under our feet. In other words, friends, Life comes through the water. Maybe that's what Jesus is thinking as he sits there next to us. Maybe he's reflecting on that life which is now possible. Maybe we ought to as well. Truth be told, many of us can't actually remember our baptisms. And those among, there are those among us who've yet to experience it. But we know water, don't we? We know water. 
We know that we feel differently after our shower than we did before it. And yes, some of it is that the dirt and grime of the world has been washed away, but there's more to it than that. That's why we want to stand there under that stream. There's something about it, and it's that, that, whatever that is about water, that renewing, that rejuvenation, that renewal that comes from water that we want to hold on to in baptism. We make it so complicated. We've spent the last 500 years as a church arguing about what happens in baptism. We argue about who's allowed to do it, about how old you have to be, about whether to use a little bit of water or a whole lot of water, but perhaps we're missing the point. It's a sign, a symbol, a reminder to us of God's grace, a grace which is there whether we're ever baptized whether we find our way into those waters or not. And we can afford to remember that grace. In other words, friends, baptism is not there to literally make us clean. No more than communion is there to literally fill us up. No, it's there to remind, her, to remind us that each day is a chance to start again. Each time we encounter water, we have a chance to renew our lives, to embrace a fresh start. Maybe some of us, as we sit by the water this morning, could use one. Maybe we could use a fresh start this morning. We know of at least one weatherman who may be looking for one. What a strange week. Reminder to us of just how much power a single word has to change our life, to change our community, to change the world around us. And if we're honest, we don't really know what to think. On the one hand, we recognize that he said he didn't mean to say it. We'll never know what's in his head or in his heart. We understand that he didn't know, and in the absence of anything to the contrary, perhaps we ought to cautiously accept his apology and lean on grace. After all, part of grace, the hard part, is giving people the benefit of the doubt. Lord knows we've all needed it from time to time. On the other hand, we also know that intention is only one part of meaning. That we can say or act or vote in a particular way with good intentions and it can still do damage. It can still cause harm in our world. How many times have we said something and didn't know how it came across to someone else? How many times have we stood even this morning and said something and weren't sure about how it would be taken by the people around us? We know what this is like, don't we? We know what it's like to try and say something, to mean one thing and have it heard another way. What we mean by something is not fully what it means. And we can't pretend like this one moment happened in isolation. As if it occurred in a vacuum, the truth is we're living in a world right now where People say and mean these things each and every day. And over the last few years, as we've watched that white nationalism bubble up to the surface, it has given voice to those people who say hateful things. And though those of us with lighter skin might never know the pain that a single word can cause, we can try. We've become so flippant with our words. So cavalier with our hatred, forgetting that it does damage. The way we speak to one another matters. The words we use matter. And if nothing else, this week has reminded us of that. 
maybe we could all use a do-over, a fresh start, a chance to go back, place our peace on go, and roll again. The good news, friends, is that today we have that moment. As we sit alongside Jesus, praying over the water, as we sit and reflect on baptism, we have a moment to start anew. That's part of what baptism is. You see, baptism is a commitment, not just us to God, but God to us, not just us to the community, but the community to us. That's why we baptize infants, because it's not just about us, it's about us. It's the commitment everybody is making to one another. And every time we remember that, every time we touch water, every time we come in contact with it, we have a chance to start again. That commitment there is a reminder that we're not in this alone. That no matter how imperfectly we speak, no matter what words we use, we are not in this on our own. We never know what a day is going to bring. We heard that before, haven't we? We never know what a day is going to bring. There's no promise that as people of faith, things are going to turn out well for us. As we know, they won't always. No, the promise is that we won't have to face them alone. And we can face a lot. If we know we don't have to face it alone. Jesus had his whole ministry ahead of him. As he sits here next to us and looking at the water, we might imagine that he had some sense of the call that God had placed on his life. He might have had some sense of what was ahead and perhaps was a little scared. A little frightened. Maybe he had, like we so often do, some self-doubt. Maybe he understood that he couldn't do this alone. Neither can we. Not even the greatest among us. Before he had a park with his name on it. Before he won the Nobel Peace Prize. before he stood on the steps of that memorial and shared with the world his dream. Martin Luther King Jr. was a preacher at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. I had the honor of standing in his pulpit there just a few years ago. A modest church for a modest man who when the knock came at the door, answered. See, he didn't start the Montgomery bus boycott. Someone else did that. In fact, the summer before, he had been offered a leadership position in the NAACP, that local chapter, and said, no, I just want to focus on my congregation and on my family. And yet, when that knock came, he couldn't help but open the door, opening the basement of his church to those conversations that he knew God was calling him to have. Only as sometimes happens when preachers speak about social issues, not everybody appreciates. It, they started to say, Preacher, why don't you just stick to the Bible? As if the gospel could be divorced from the world. And the calls began to come in. Day and night, violent and sexual and threatening, and his wife, Coretta, young mother with an infant baby girl, would take the calls and hang up, take the calls and hang up, having to answer the phone because they knew there were important calls coming that they just could not miss, and so they kept answering the phone and hanging up. And one day, after it had reached a fever pitch of 40 calls a day that they'd have to hang up, 
king couldn't sleep. And he got up in the middle of the night at midnight, and he went downstairs, and he ran the water for just a moment. He poured himself a cup of coffee, and he began to pray. He said in that moment he needed this religion that he had preached, that he had taught, that he had learned to be true. He needed this to be true. So he prayed out loud, God, I'm trying. I'm trying to be faithful. I'm trying to do what is right. I believe in this movement. I believe this is where I am called to do, but I am scared and I am tired and I am losing my courage. And he heard a voice. Perhaps you know it. Speak to him. Martin Luther, you stand up for what is right. Stand up for truth. Stand up for righteousness. And lo, I will be with you until the end of the world. He said that in that moment he heard the words of Jesus that he felt his presence there next to him. And he knew that he wasn't alone. And in the days and weeks and months and years ahead after his home was bombed and he was stabbed and his friends were killed, even after he knew that his life would inevitably come to an end in a violent way, He kept those words in his head, Lo, I am with you. Until the end of the world. And on that promise he stood. If we look carefully, We watch. We just can make out the moment when that spirit descends like a dove. And if we listen, we can hear in our mind's eye, our mind's ear, that voice speaking to Jesus, you are my son. The beloved, with you I am well pleased. And maybe, friends, if we can keep listening, we stay by the water long enough watching the bubbles, the lap of the waves. We might hear that voice speaking to us. You are my daughter. You are my son. You are my child. With you, I am well pleased. Amen.